All right, and now we're back. Continuing our childhood. A Sir Brent. As we left off, we just took our sacrament and accepted our lot in life. The mark left on you by the sacrament takes a long, long time to heal. Mother says it's a reminder of your lot, suffering and sufferance, pain and patience. Gloria shows you the mark of the lash on her shoulder one day. It will never disappear. You are a commoner now. This is the lot you were born into. Your father keeps telling you to study hard so you may yet earn a different lot and become a noble of the mantle. You recall the past with warm sadness. Would Stefan still live with you, or when he wrote to you for the short time after he left? Now he thinks it's below him to write to commoners in his family. Mother didn't lock herself in the bedroom as often back then. This changed shortly after Nathan was born. But most importantly, you miss the time before the terrifying figure of your grandfather was constantly looming over you. You learn the true power of Lot only after the head of the family's arrival. In your grandfather's eyes, no commoner deserves to be treated with kindness. Is this just him, or is it the way of the entire world? The very thought makes you queasy. You're older now, and what's more, you're an elder brother now. You've learned to care about someone else, how to teach and protect. Soon, you are all small boy no longer. As the days pass, play gradually gives way to laborious study. Now, your choices will decide your place in the bizarre and ruthless world of adulthood. Your childhood years are over. Alright, so in the last year, or last couple episodes, you were born. Stefan, our sister Gloria, took their sacrament. Our little brother was born. Grandfather, that asshole that he is, came into our house and killed me for the first time. Got some fencing lessons from father, and we learned our lot in life. Our determination's pretty high. We're inquisitive. Absolutely no willpower. So let us continue our story. Adolescence. You lived in this world for eight years now. As you grow older, life grows more complex. The world of your childhood is limited to your house and family, but now that realm is expanding. It also includes your neighborhood, the nearby houses, the streets of the ancient city of, sorry, still early, just waking up. The ancient city of Anzote. A question now looms over you, growing more pressing with each passing year. What will your place be in this vast outside world? Few people in blessed arcane empire trouble themselves with this question. It's not within a man or woman's power to choose. Their destiny is predetermined by their birth and those who bore them. And yet your particular birth has granted you a choice. Your father is a man of nobility, a worthy example in matters of duty and honor. Your mother is a commoner of lowly estate, humility, and patience made flesh. 
and your sky is ablaze day and night with the light of the shining pillar. The beacon of the clergy. Your back bears the mark of the lash. Will you accept the drudgery and suffering that is the lot of the lowborn for your entire life? Or will you follow in the footsteps of your father and your father's father and fight for the right to serve the arcane empire as a noble of the mantle? Perhaps you will follow the twin god's word and offer spiritual guidance to others. The answers lie out there in the vast, terrifying world. What awaits you beyond the walls of your home? Alright, so we have some new stats. Nobility, Ingenuity, Spirituality, Power is still there. So now we got our relations. Which I got none. The province. Patriarch of the Magra province and founder of the new faith. He was the first to defy the lots established in the teachings of... Is that this? I had this. He encouraged people to find the twin gods within and says that everyone is equal in the twin's eye. Archduke of Magra. Supreme Lord in the province of your birth, known for being obstinate and despotic, notorious even among the Archimanes. Got a map of the area here. Interesting. So, this is our hometown right down here at the bottom. And this is where that bastard grandfather came from. I believe that's where he sent off our brother Stefan to a boarding school. expects more and more of you as you grow up. The teachers and tutors hired by your father keep you on your toes all the time. Your life these days is dedicated to studying your future, or the future, of the Brandt family. Your younger brother Nathan keeps growing up too. He can hold a conversation now. You never refuse him when he comes to play, provided you have a bit of free time between your demanding lessons. It's a rainy day today. Father and mother have gone to the wall. And they left Nathan in your care. You lose track of time over the books in the sitting room, and Nathan goes off alone to splash in the creek. Soon you hear his voice begging you to come outside. He's on the porch, sobbing, all covered in dirt. You walk up to him as he continues to bawl. It's all... It's all that kid. He, he pushed me into the ditch and called me names. He said I was a fancy pants fool. 
I said I'll call my brother, he's still there. You have to go push him, Horston. Nathan points at a lopsided wooden house further down the street with the proper where the poorer artisans live. You see two boys lingering there in the con in on <clears throat> You see two boys lingering there on the porch. They're clearly both commoners, but from a poor but far from poor. One of them is almost as tall as Nathan, and he frowns in a funny way, just like him. He looks older, almost your age, but he's more broad-shouldered and taller. His name is Thomas. You've heard it before. There, that's him. Nathan points at the younger boy that hides behind your, that hides behind your back. Thomas grins and rolls up his sleeves to reveal strong arms. He must have been helping his father with manual labor for quite some time. Listen up, rich boys. We don't give a damn about you or your friendship. We don't let nobody call our home a stinking rat hole. Your, brother, your little brother earned his ditch dive. Maybe next time he'll dress normal and stop picking fights with people who can throw him in the mud. Your hands clench into a fist before you react. Nathan called them names first, and the wonder they did the same. That's how it goes. But pushing your little brother into a ditch is too much. Thomas stands tall and confident. He sees no threat in you. You're about to get ready for a fight when you feel a tug on your sleeve. You turn your head to see Nathan, the one who started the whole mess. What is he saying? Nathan keeps tugging in your sleeve hard and fire, harder and harder. Finally, you turn to look at him. Don't fight him, please. Look, he's huge. Let's go home. Who cares about them? You're all sweaty. You're the one who wanted this fight. Are you gonna listen to your little brother and walk away like a coward? All you rich boys are chickens. You do nothing but squawk, but when push comes to shove, you run home to mommy. Now he's done it, your patience has run out, you swing at Thomas, and he jumps back surprised by his assault. It takes him a moment to compose himself, but he is ready. His fists cover his face and he attacks you with a quick jab. Now it's your turn to take a step back. You start trading blows, huffing and puffing with rage. Your younger, the younger brothers gawk in awe at the sight. Thomas does not resort to fancy moves, dirty tricks, or stupid taunts. He displays nothing but skill earned in, the, in many a street fight. And his heavy fists aim for your head. You keep dodging him again and again, trying to reach him. He takes a couple of glancing blows, but easily shakes them off. What a bruiser. You start swinging your fists with greater and greater fury. Your heart is bound, pounding like a hammer. You see nothing but the foe in front of you. How much longer will this take? You're worn out. Your breath grows ragged and your mu muscles grow heavy. But there's no way you can give up now. Nathan is watching you. Desperate and out of options, you swing a punch you swing and punch Thomas square in the nose, then immediately let his fist smack you in the temple. The blow rings through your head like a bell and blinds you for a moment. The world swims before your eyes. You clutch at your head to get your bearings. Thomas is standing in front of you, blood dripping from his nose. You no longer want to fight it out, and it seems your opponent would rather end it too. But you, st but you keep standing there eyeing each other angrily. Then suddenly, you hear an angry shout next to you. An enraged man in a craftsman apron is shaking his fist. Thomas's face contorts into a terror right away. 
It's my father, run. The punishment for fighting is flogging. And your prospect of that makes you run like the wind. Thomas sprints in front of you. You dash across the rotten wooden planks of the back alley, up and over the lopsided fence, across a giant puddle in one leap, then forward into the tall grass. You hide there and stay quiet. You hear no sounds in pursuit. You exchange glances with Thomas and start laughing. His laughter is loud and infectious, but soon he cuts it short and grows sadder. I'm gonna get flogged anyway. My dad's always quick to give me a beating. And then he'll start nagging me about the lots and the prayers for the days like he always does. Why do I always get myself mixed up in this stuff? The fighting's the only way to prove you're worth anything, right? The Alts didn't see you fighting, you tell him. So all I have to do now is convince him that you were. Nosebleeds happen, right? Mother gets nosebleeds all the time. Well, we could try it. Let's hope our little brothers don't tell on us. We'll talk. I'll talk to mine. There's a scratch on your head. Don't let them see it. Good thing I didn't hit you in the face. They're good as new. You assure him that Nathan will never tell, and in return. Make sure he base, behaves himself so he won't get tossed into a ditch again. With that, you shake hands with Thomas. His handshake is as strong as you would expect based on his fists. You make your way out of the tall grass. You need to leave before Thomas's father goes to your family and complains about you breaking your lot. You come to a really a realization on the way back. You had no idea place where you were hiding even existed. It wasn't too far from home. Thomas smiles in excitement when he hears this. Oh, I know lots of places like that. I'll tell you what. If we get out of this mess today, I'll show you a way to the old fortress wall. It's a perfect place to build your own fort. I dragged a bunch of wooden planks there. Too bad it's no fun to build all alone. My brother never helped me. He just gets in the way. You emerge from the muddy back alleys, united by a secret only you two know. It seems you made a friend today. Well, we got quite a bit for that. We met Thomas. years old. It's blistering hot today. Even for the sun-parched land of Magra. As soon as you're done with your studies, you dash outdoors. Out of the stuffy room. You and Thomas roll up your shirt sleeves, but it barely helps. You would, glad you would gladly go shirtless, had you only been in the company of other boys. But there are three girls in the yard today. They're all doing the laundry in a big wash tub, whispering and giggling. If you could, you would gladly keep watching one of them work. She has big eyes of deep blue. Her hair is braided, and her plain gray dress is mended and patched all over. Her name is Sophia. She throws her head back a little when she laughs. The rays of sun on are reflected in her eyes. You, Thomas, and the other boys keep telling silly stories, anything, to make her laugh. Sophia, you sure love telling tall tales. Oh, I remember this one time. But then Sophia hears a voice calling her home. She nods to you and runs across the street smiling. Her light steps carry her forward, but her eyes looking everywhere else. But then a stone on the road catches her foot, she stumbles and falls flat into the dust. The streets start shaking from thundering of hooves. 
Riders appear on the road from around the corner. They bear a coat of arms you recognize right away. A sable serpent blade upon a field of vert. It symbolizes the Melandes dynasty, the family of your province's archduke. The horses dash forward. A lost wooden toy on the road cracks under their hooves. They will not slow down. They are the nobles, and the rest must make way for them. Sophia is in their way. Just now starting to get back on her feet, her mother is crying for her to desperately come from behind the fence door. Her mother is crying for her desperately from behind the fence door. You freeze in terror. The rider the riders surely see the girl. Are they are they going to stop? Or are they going to trample her? Only a few moments, the beautiful girl will be toppled, trampled and crushed. We'll lose all our willpower. But I think it's worth it. You throw yourself blindly into the road, swinging your arms wildly. Dazed by the sounding of thundering hooves, you can see nothing in the dust. For a brief moment, the horses slow down just long enough for Sophia to get back on her feet and flee to the roadside. But then, the riders dig their spurs in. Yeah, dozens of hooves knock you off your feet and roll across your body. Your bones crack, break, and crumble. Your ears ripped apart by the thundering rhythm of the ride. Your innards are pulverized. The last thing you remember is the sound of your own skull caving in. Kind of expected that. <sighs> Impenetrable darkness surrounds you. You stand alone, bare to your very essence. It paralyzes you. You have an urge to cover yourself to hide. No one, no one would, no one should see you so vulnerable. But you cannot conceal the truth in this place. You are bathed in an unbearably bright light. It has no hint of warmth in it. It is blinding. It leaves no shadow in the entire world. It's the light of the shining pillar itself. In this radiance, you can clearly see all your thoughts and doubts, your errors and transgressions, the contradictions that have permeated you since birth. They cover you from head to toe like rough gray tatters. But they melt away in this light. You're naked. You feel liberated and whole. It is, a, it is as though the wounds and cracks in your soul have been healed, making it the way it should be. It is as though the scales have fallen from your eyes. You see the true shapes of things now. There are laws by which the world abides, the grand design that moves life itself. You tread a path that is barely visible in the blinding light giving shape to everything. In this light, you see an infinite complex, the infinite complexity of the world. For the tiniest leaf to the enormity of the empire. And this world maintains its balance by virtue of the law that is embedded in it during the act of creation. Ahead of you, two figures are waiting on the path. They are gigantic, many times taller than a man. The elder holds a lash, the younger a sword. The younger gaze at, gazes at you sternly, coldly. You kneel obediently before him and lower your head. The god raises his sword above you. This is divine retribution. There is no law without it nor can there be. Every action has consequences. This is what shapes the world, making its very existence possible. 
in this moment beneath the gaze of a merciless god you comprehend the law that binds the entire world together which manifestation of the law will you live by Your life work shapes the world, and thus you influence the great law itself. Let's rebel. Let's rebel. The blade flashes. The younger sword slashes through the air above your head. You do not yet deserve your final punishment. The law demands that you continue your life. Your form has not been completely destroyed, nor has the world. The younger extends his gigantic hand and shows you the way. You must proceed. The path leads you to the top of the crown of the silver tree. Spread wide in the white gleam, the branches are closed, are closed now time to descend you're drawn downward into the darkness the shadows that had disappeared in the blinding glow creep around you and envelop you this is to be expected but the purity and clarity of the spirit are still with you something is forged something is forcing your throat open air it scratches you on the inside your soul is filled with struggle again, and the contradictions from which the fabric of this world and you yourself are woven. The divine light that gave you clarity is fading away with each passing moment. You have to open your eyes. Above you is the dark ceiling of the crypt. You are reborn. You can feel again. You sense your body, head, arms, and legs. The light fades around you, obedient before a will that is stronger than you. You return to the world. Such is the law of the twins. You will return to the world until your time of the, until the time of your true death. And in this world, you will have a body with which to feel pain, suffering, and pleasure. You smell a stickly, moist odor. You open your eyes and see the figures of your mother and father in the gloom of the family crypt, speaking to each other quietly. They stop as soon as they hear you gasp. Mother runs to you and locks you in, a, in an embrace as father wraps... <clears throat> sorry. Your mother runs to you and locks you in an embrace as your father wraps his cloak around you. Neither of them say a word as they lead you out to the surface and back home. You met a terrible end, my son. You were trampled by those horses. Don't be so careless ever again. The lives you were granted by the twin gods are not to be wasted so recklessly. You would be punished for this, but the twins have already meted out their punishment. You tremble. Your steps unsteady as you learn how to move again. Your body is eerily smooth, fresh, and renewed. Even the recent scars and scratches are all gone. But there's something new on it. A fresh black mark. A reminder of your lesser death beneath those who wounds. Remember that. By the twins' mercy, we are all given enough time in this world. Should you die before your time, you'll be brought back by their grace. For three times they will rescue you from a terrible fate. But the fourth death will be true and final for all. Every loss of a life we are granted at our birth is a heavy blow to us. But the gods told us not to mourn a lesser death. And so we will humbly accept this and move on. See? Your body has been reborn anew, with all your wounds healed. Do not mourn your loss of life, my son, but thank the twin gods for their justice. And do not speak of this, and do not ever play by the road again if you wish to keep on living. 
he cautiously go back outside the next day. The children from the neighborhood surround you. They all saw you get trampled. And now they all ask you the same question. What was it like to die? Thomas rescues you from their pestering. He pushes the motley crew aside, hugs you, and pats you on the back. Look at you, buddy. You gave, you gave an entire life to keep a girl safe. Then you see Sophia. She's standing nearby, shyly working up the courage to walk over to you. Soon, she finally approaches and begins to speak rapidly. Why did you do that? Why did you throw yourself in front of the horses? My life isn't worth any more than yours. So why did you think that? You weren't supposed to die there. It was all those riders' fault. They deserve to die, not you. Her voice raises to a shriek. She suddenly stops and runs back home. You stay where you were, watching her run, the golden rays of the sun dancing in her braided hair. Okay, so we lost some of our willpower for our death. But that's alright. I think that was a worthy sacrifice. We'll try and save up our willpower in case something else happens, though. Ten years old. Sophia disappeared after the terrible incident with the horses. Her friends gossiped that her parents sent her off to serve a rich, noble dynasty. You haven't seen each other since that day, but you still remember Sophia's eyes, the sunlight shining in them. But no matter what, life goes on. You're ten years old now, your studies continue, and you're learning more about the land you live in. Enzote is a city an ancient city, in an imperial province by the name of Magra. All soil in Magra was turned to ash eons ago, scorched by magic, during the rebellion of Duke Charmelandias. The magical arts are all but gone now, but the scorched earth has remained barren and infertile ever since. Since then, the entire province has lain barren tormented by cold and scorching winds in equal measure, with few precious plants taking root on their own. All fertile land in Magra is brought elsewhere, and brought here by an endless caravan of carts and carriages. To pay for food and soil, the cities of Magra became skilled in many trades, primarily mining and digging for metals and stone. Last fall, there was an explosion just, out the city, just outside of the city, followed by clouds of thick smoke. The first such incident frightened the citizens, but then explosions of smoke became an everyday occurrence. Soon everyone grew used to it. Father explains that the miners are using a new invention called gunpowder. It makes it easy for them to reach precious stone and metals buried deep within the earth. Then one day, a thunderous explosion rocks the city. A black billowing smoke covers the houses. People are stuck in their homes, all windows tightly shut. The air is impossible to breathe. Nathan coughs all the time. Gloria and you cough only when nobody is watching. If mother hears it, she'll make you inhale those hot herbal vapors just like Nathan. It takes two days for the black smoke to disperse. People pour out onto the streets and meet their friends. Thomas is eager to share everything he knows about the incident with you. They took lots of burnt up people to the city temple. Mom told me she was helping the healers. There are many rumors. Some claim it was the work of a beast stirred from its slumber, while others say it was the surviving witches that continue to threaten the order and the empire with their accursed powers. But as for you, you, you patiently wait for father to come back home, and then you'll ask him about it. Father spends all day and night 
working at the prefecture, while Mother spends all her time in prayer. It takes a full week for Father to finally come home, and he's almost completely spent. You muster enough courage during dinner to ask him what happened outside the city. Father raises his head, his face bleak, a weary mask, and starts muttering his proclamation. It's almost as if he doesn't see you. It's the mine outside the city. We were trying to get to a vein of war. There was an explosion. The mine caved in, and the black smoke started following, started flowing. Many workers died there. It was all because Count Elvasco, who owns the mine, wanted them to start mining that vein before they were ready. Some of the workers weren't even reborn. Perhaps the twins thought their final time had come. The, prefe the prefecture is inundated with complaints from families that have lost their breadwinners. <clears throat> Alright, let's try that one again. The prefecture has been inundated with complaints from families that have lost their breadwinners, asking the judges for help. Many people also lost their cattle to the black smoke. Count of Vassico blames gunpowder for the disaster. The prefecture and the newspapers just repeat whatever he says, but it's plain old greed and tyranny of noblemen that are to blame. Why the welfare of our province is always paid for with the commoners' lives. Then, without warning, he grows silent again. He keeps thinking about it for days. Can a human life really end so easily? A single moment of bad luck, and you die. Only to re-emerge from the temple or the family crypt with a new black mark on your arm, or worse. You remain where you fell, dead. Never to be reborn again. Ever. So the wealth of Magra went up because they got to that vein. I imagine they'll still keep mining it, but peace has gone down a bit. And all the while, the nobles don't care. During lunch, Father tells you to stay home in the evening and prepare to meet some important guests. Your older brother Stefan will return home by dinner tonight. Joining him will be your grandfather, Gregor Brandt, as well as a noble friend of the family. You're, ex you're excited about your brother's return. It's been years since you last saw him. How has he changed during his time away from home? You and father await the guests anxious anxiously. The doorbell rings, three people are standing outside. Grandfather is the first to come in, naturally. He has not changed a bit since his last visit. Still eyeing the house with contempt, looking for any reason to demean it. Grandfather is followed by a stately young man dressed in a jacket embroidered with silver, whom you barely recognize as your brother. Stefan casts a glance at your threadbare clothes your dirty fingernails and smirks. The last to enter the house is a personal gentleman with a worn out wrinkled face. You've heard a lot about this man from your father and grandfather. He is Baron Augustine Elborn, Stefan's uncle, a family friend and the prophet and the province's perfect prefect. <clears throat> which means that he is the head judge and thus father's superior. Sir Elborn smiles lightly and offers you his hand. And this must be your younger brother, yes? You have your father's eyes, young man. Father bows slightly to grandfather and Sir Elborn. There is a moment of quiet when Stefan's turn comes. Father reaches out to him awkwardly, expecting an embrace. 
There's a question in Safan's eyes as he looks at Grandfather. The old man shakes his head, almost imperceptibly. Imperceptibly. We noblemen ought to put our emotions on... Oughtn't put our emotions on public display, Father. Not even after a lengthy separation. Really? Just hug the man. There is no embrace. Instead, St Stefan nods to Father Curtly. He responds in kind, his face devoid of emotion. Man. That prick of a grandfather really brainwashed him. I mean, Stefan's always been a bit of a prick, but still, there are limits. After the greeting, you proceed to the sitting room. Elborn is the first to enter. He kisses Mother's hand, and Gloria's too, and tussles Nathan's hair after seeing him hiding by the table. Grandfather acknowledges them with a glum nod. How is it this guy I'm only meeting for the first time, Elborn, is friendlier with my family than my own grandfather? Greetings, Lydia Brandt. I remember you. You were kind to me when I was but a child. And you must be Nathan. You could barely walk when I saw you last. Dude, that's your mother. And your brother. I don't care if they're only half siblings. God damn it. Your elder brother ignores Gloria completely. Not even a greeting. You proceed to the dining room with a dignified manner and take your seats. The dishes smell delicious, but they merely punctuate the overwhelming tension at the table. Elborn is the only one with a friendly smile on his face. The dinner is splendid, Lydia. You did choose the dishes yourself. You have a truly refined palate. It warms my heart to know Stefan spent his early years with you. Womanly care always does a child good, no matter the estate. True enough. Your fork freezes in the air halfway to your mouth. You expect many things from a noble of the sword. But words of praise for a low-born woman are not one of them. You cast a glance at Grandfather. He looks like he's about to choke on those words. It would do my grandson more good to stay in a boarding stool among his equals. Oh, please, Gregor. Parenting is no less important. Nothing can replace a mother's love. I cannot deny it. It saddens me greatly that my late sister could not be there to raise Stefan. But there was still a family for him when he was surrounded by love. How could that be bad? And besides, his father was, beside, was at his side all the while. Your father's example is always the best. A father's example is always the best, after all. Robert earned the judge's rank the same way you did. Your grandson will surely follow in your footsteps. And who knows, perhaps even the younger men of the Brandt family will contribute to the... You clumsy, low-born cretin. Everybody's startled by this sudden outburst. Grandfather's face turns red. He is glaring at a young lady servant holding a pitcher over a glass. Stefan is sitting right next to her, dabbing a napkin on a fresh stain on his jacket. Be gone this instant. The lady servant runs away, leaving the pitcher on a small table by the door. After a quiet moment, Elborn smiles again. It, it appears the servants have left us, yet dinner is far from over. Worry not, Uncle. There are enough commoners at this table to keep us served with food and drink. Stefan glares at Gloria across the table. She is sitting next to you. She shrinks down and hunches over his under <clears throat> and hunches over under his gaze. Father throws his brow. Mother covers her mouth with a trembling hand. Grandfather sneers. Stefan Stefan's gaze does not move. The silent lasts far too long. Then she starts to raise from the chair. If the Brant gentlemen so wish it. 
your hands clenched into fists under the table. How can he bring himself to humiliate his own family? His own mother? A sister like this? It is all grandfather's doing. Stefan cannot even bring himself to embrace father without his permission? And yet? They are noblemen, and they have the right to act this way? If there is... If there is any way this dinner can become even more unbearable, you, you do not want to see it. You rise from the table and help your sister wait on your family, changing the dynamic. You try to act like nothing happened. You step out of line and install Stefan for what he has done. Hmm. Well, I'm not just going to gloss over this. This has to be addressed in some way or another. So we could just call out our brother, insult him, or we could just get up without saying a word and do a woman's work as if it were perfectly natural. dignity of a family. You deliberate for a moment, then take a napkin off your lap and raise to join Gloria. A moment later, you hear the sound of another chair moving. Your mother joins you. The three of you now refill glasses, serve food, and clear away dishes. Sir Elborn tries to make small talk with father, but in vain. So he focuses on his attention on Grandfather and Stefan. Grandfather is pleased to inform him of Stefan's achievements at the boarding school, especially his exemplary sword fighting skills. He constantly stretch, stresses the importance, your elder brother, of you. <clears throat> he constantly stresses the importance of your elder brother for the future of the family. You listen to him dispassionately as you continue serving new dishes to the table. As you wait at the nobleman's table, you, your sister, and mother never bump into each other. Your labor is impeccable. Your grandfather could not have found fault even if he had tried. Your shoulder and back are aching, but being a manservant inside your own house hurts even more. When the guests finally leave, Mother and Gloria embrace you with relief. You did not neglect your relatives and shared their humiliation, and the composure that you have shown gave you new strength. Damn right. Eleven years. Hot, dry wind sweeps through the city from the barren lands around it. The noble residents of Anzoit prefer to remain in their chambers, while the, com while the commoners huddle in tents or in the shade of the silver tree. You're on an errand right now. Your father wrote a letter to a noble acquaintance, and you are to deliver it. Thomas, the boy down the street, is tagging along. The two of you are inseparable now. The errand's an easy one. You just so you decide to take this opportunity to loiter around the part of Anzuit where the nobles live. So here you are in the middle of the city square, resting on the ancient brickwork by the old fountain in the merciful shade of the gargantuan silver tree. Thomas is by your side, lazily slouching on the edge of the fountain's basin. It's a hard life for commoners like you and me. Either you break your back in a workshop day and night, hoping someone will buy your goods someday, or you become a manservant to some noble. You never get a chance to enjoy life. This is your lot, you remind him. You work and endure and suffer. The 
as Thomas waves your words away. Yeah, I know all that already. Mother keeps drilling that stuff into me. We must be humble. Our strength and his patience and persistence. Oh yeah, I say. But I want to make my fortune no matter what. So how ain't that living by my lot? But the lots, they ain't easy. Let's take you for example, Brant. Your father's a nobleman. But even if that but even if that didn't make you one, just look at your hands. You never had to work as hard as me. But we have the same lot. So we're supposed to suffer the same? Or look at your father. He's a judge. He toils at the prefecture all day and night to doing his judging. And he's a noble? I've never seen an Arcanine work as hard as he does. He struck. Arcanines are a different race. The books say they were born to rule over humans. They're never commoners, always noble. Always nobles of the sword by birth. They founded the empire after subduing all the human kingdoms on the continent. Humans will never be their equal. Arcanines are always better, smarter, stronger. Their skin is a noble shade of blue. If the books are to, believe, to be believed, of course, you've never seen one yourself. Your idle chatter is suddenly interrupted by a rugged looking guardsman dressed in black and green. He chases you away from the fountain. Common rabble like you have no place here. You hear the clattering of hooves and wheels against the cobblestone and see flags bearing the coat of arms. A sable serpent on a field of vert. It makes you squirm. It's the Archduke's coat of arms. Melanda's dynasty. The carriage door opens, revealing a young lady in a luxurious dress. You cannot look away from her. Those dainty shoulders suggested but not revealed by the cut of her dress. Her black hair cascading over them, her stately slim silhouette, her pouty lips and prim nose, those dark, like, those dark like night, <clears throat> those eyes dark like the night sky, the way she moves fluidly and gracefully, and most impeccable of all, her skin glows in azure blue. She is almost a masterpiece given life. She is an Arcanine. Clear the way for me. Octavia. The Melanda's guardsmen work quickly to clear the way to the fountain of the, for the Arcanine lady. The searing sun dances on her skin in bizarre patterns. With one elegant motion, she reveals the handkerchief, then leans over the basin and wipes her head and neck with the cool water. But not all me. That's Octavia Melandes, our Archduke's own daughter. The Arcanine turns away and proceeds gracefully back to her carriage. You see something slip out of her hand and fall onto the cobblestone right next to you. Her handkerchief. It is right there by your feet. Intricate craftsmanship. Intricate craftsmanship. Expensive woven fabric, delicate de delicately decorated with emerald filigree. Your heart skips a beat. Will you dare draw the beautiful Arcanine's attention in order to return her lost possession? Or would you rather not attempt to cross the chasm between her and you? Hmm, I would lose absolutely all my willpower to talk to this woman. Quickly hide the trophy. Plan to sell it later. Or do we keep it as a memento? Hmm. I don't know, I feel like there's gonna be better things in this chapter to waste my willpower on. I'm not gonna sell it. 
so then the only other option would be to keep the handkerchief as a memento. Pretty sure if I do this, those guards are just gonna smash my skull in, right? I already have two deaths down. Uh, but if we keep it, I imagine they'll say we stole it. Or we keep it, and years later, when we're introduced to her again, we return it as a mobile. Carefully observe Lady Octavia as she leaves. Her delicate fingers move through the square like a walking dream. Her elegant hands gliding through the air. Her hair flowing in the light breeze. Your eyes watch all of her. She returns to the carriage, leaning on a guardsman's shoulder as she gracefully climbs back inside. The soft handkerchief feels warm in your hand. You fold it carefully and hide it in your pocket. The carriage drives away, marked by the thudding rhythm of hooves. Until that day, you associated the Melanda's destiny, dynasty with nothing but indifferent cruelty. But now, your breast pocket holds a proof of yet another quality they possess. Beauty. Alright, we got quite a lot of willpower for that. I think... That's the what that was the best choice to make. So now we have a lot more choices we can do in the future. Twelve years. Twelve years old now? You overhear an important conversation. It's the last spring night, and Mother has just sent everyone to bed. You walk past Father's study and hear voices coming from beyond the door. Grandfather is yelling, and Father is replying quietly. The elder Brant men are arguing, are fighting, about the place of the commoners in the city. You sneak outside to avoid, more, avoid Mother's attention and hide next to the open window of the study. Perhaps they'll mention you too. <clears throat> that low-life idiot had the gall to pay me a visit and beg me for some service. He had the insolence to ask me outright. He thought I was going to support his claim for the chairman's seat in the lesser quorum? How dare he! Father, please listen. Mayor Egmont may be lowborn, but he carries a lot of clout on Magra. He owns five iron mines, a friend of... A friend like him could be quite useful, should he become a chairman of the Lesser Quorum. I don't give a man who this Egmont is, Robert. What he is, however, is lowborn. His lot is humility and obedience. The likes of him can never rule anything. They're nothing but a flock of sheep that need a, that need a firm, noble hand to guide them. I wasted so many years trying to quash that quorum decree, but that accursed Cornelius Tempest did everything in his power to make the Empire sign that pathetic screed. And now, even lowlifes can wield power. True power, Robert. Just the right to discuss the size of the Archduke's tax, nothing more. That is only the beginning, what's next? Are they going to arm the lowlifes now? Make them into judges? If the Empire rejects the foundations and the lots, the entire ed edifice will crumble. Ugh. Who am I telling this to? It is already crumbling and you, my son and heir, are the harbingers of its destruction. Father, I'm begging you. I do not wish to marry a third time. Lydia is a good wife and a dutiful mother to my children. If you would only allow her to, I will allow them nothing. Neither Egmont nor the freeloading wench of yours. 
No, fuck you. What will you want me to do next? Live by the laws of the lowborn? I can already see where this is going. And I'd rather run my own sword through my guts than live in a country where nobles and lowlifes share the same rights. My only dream is to see the name of Brandt in the blue book. But that dream will never come true. They'll never call me Venerable El Brandt. And it's all because of this marriage of yours. My only hope now is to hear Stefan address in such a manner one day. Thank the twins I didn't let you ruin the boy. He's about to grow up a true nobleman. His children will bear the name of El Brandt. You have two more grandsons. Those spineless milksops from the common lot. They're incapable of anything. The best your middle son could do is sneak into the Imperial College and get a noble by the mantle. Although, I have grave doubts even of that. As for the downtrodden Nathan, I hold out no hope for him whatsoever. You hear Grandfather's heavy footsteps, the thudding of his cane, and the slamming of a door. It's time to sneak back home before you're discovered. You started studying at the school of Sir Tibor and began to master the sciences. A storm of expectations. Finally, the day comes when the teachers stop coming to the house. But before you, but before you can breathe a sigh of relief and put away the books, father asks you to come to his study. You've grown, my son. It's time for you to continue your, to continue your education away from home. I've chosen a deserving school for you, Sir Tibber School for children of noblemen and well-off commoners. Naturally, it is not a boarding school for nobles, so you'll study there during the day and come home in the evening. You share the news with your best friend, Thomas. Sir Tibber's school, eh? Gotta ask my parents to send me there soon as they get enough coin together. Father says his workshop has toiled day and night for years to save up, to save up for my education. The school is based in an ancient estate of the Arcanine design. The classrooms are tall and spacious with massive benches. The sounds of scraping quills and lectures on history and imperial law and theology echo under the vaulted ceilings. The rules are strict, the lessons tiring. Restless Thomas keeps getting distracted, and several times he gets his hands slapped with a stick for it. Every teacher demands flawless mastery of their subject. Every day, Father asks you about your studies. You have already told him twice now Magra joined the Empire, and how the noble's court of honor is different from the commoner's civil court in the city prefecture. But Father keeps pressuring you to work even harder. <clears throat> when it's time to go to bed, Mother will not let you go to sleep until you recite a newly learned prayer for her. And when it's time to go to school, you promise to her every day that you will behave with a great humility and steer clear of insolent behavior of any kind. For you still live by the commoner's lot, and that lot is hard work and suffering. Your first month in school draws to a close. And the teachers announce that there will be exams at the end of the month to determine the best and the worst students in each subject. Father insists that you devote all your spare time to studying law and history if you wish to follow in his footsteps. But when you speak to Mother every day, you start considering theo theology. You still remember the, re the revelations and divine visions that came to you in your earliest years. You have only one more day until the exam. You have locked your way, locked yourself away in your room. It's already getting late. Your desk is covered with handwritten notes, surrounded by leather. 
Your desk is covered with handwritten notes, surrounded by leather-bound books. Just looking at them makes you queasy, but you have to read through all of them again. At least for one of your subjects. There is a nagging thought in your mind. Thomas ended up in big trouble the other day. He got into a fight with several boys who live next and who live on the next street. They heard about your wooden fortress and got in an outrage by the fortification built by a commoners. They swore to dismantle it tonight. Thomas swore he would defend the fortress until the end. Perhaps you should abandon the books to rescue your friend in need. But then you hear your little brother Nathan knocking at the door. He stands there shyly, not saying a word. He often does that, standing still and staying speechless until you speak first or he runs away. But this time, he actually says something. The door is locked. Are you okay? Is there anything I can do to help? Your head is spinning. This is the last evening before the school exam. If you fail, your family will be very disappointed. You have to refresh your memory on law or theology. Either one or the other. But Thomas and your fort are about to be stormed. Why today of all days? You grind your teeth in rage at the thought. Nathan is by the door trying not to bother you. He wants to help you the only way he can, for reasons known only to him. Will you accept his help? So I could study, help Thomas, or talk to Nathan. really if this is to send Nathan out to help Thomas that doesn't really do any good because what's he gonna do uh, and wasting the education that was paid for uh, See what Nathan has to say. You cannot help but pay attention to your brother's quiet, weak voice. You push the books away. Nathan runs to you and wraps his arms around your leg. You shouldn't just leave you alone. I don't want you to get sick. Warmth emanates from his hands. You feel a burden of the responsibilities thrust upon you. You feel the burden of the responsibilities thrust upon you fall from your shoulders. At least you realize something. You can make your own decisions rather than submitting to the will of others. You laugh at this realization and feel a new spring in your step. Nathan laughs with you, laughs with joy when he feels this. He takes your hand and pulls you outside. You study in enough. You spent the rest of the evening playing with your little brother, teaching him how to build a watchtower out of wooden planks, sticks, and old rags behind the house. Nathan's success and construction leaves much to be desired, unlike his skill in covering himself with mud. But he's still absolutely overjoyed. The morning comes, and you barely have the time to wake up before you're walking to the menacing edifice of the school. The entire day is a constant flow of questions, demanding answers. You give satisf satisfactory responses on law and history, although you are somewhat confused by the many technicalities of chronological orders. Your knowledge of interpretations of the laws leaves much to be desired. Your parents are dissatisfied with your performance. <clears throat> you know that you could have worked harder. Still, you believe yesterday was not a waste. Not at all. Or 
we're maxed out on willpower, so we should start making some tough choices. Maybe. Your education continues as you, as you study imperial law. You come to realize that there is a certain hierarchy within the noble estate. It seems your father's status is not quite equal to that of the more eminent human, an Arcanine Chantry. You return home with this new information at your disposal. Father asks you about school after dinner, as he always does. And what is the difference between nobles of the mantle and those of the sword? You have... <clears throat> you already have an answer ready. The latter status is hierarchy, is hereditary, meaning that it is passed down from father to son. After the Arcanines, nobles of the sword are the most eminent humans of the Empire. They own land and estates, they fill offices of the highest rank, and the names of their bloodlines are preserved within the Great Blue Book. Nobility of the sword can only be granted can only be granted only by the overseer of the province, or the Emperor himself. And how are such eminent people addressed? With the honorific L before their last name, you respond. Sir Augustine Elborn, for example. Father pats you on the sh shoulder, clearly pleased. And what about the Arcanines and their status? What have you learned about them? The Arcanines stand above all human gentry. They are born to rule over humans, regardless of their titles. No L is required when addressing them. They need no honorifics for the names of their ancient dynasties are known to all. Father nods somberly. Yes, we can never be their equals, do whatever an Arcanine tells you, and never defy them, ever. And what about your grandfather and me? Where do we stand as nobles? That is easy, father and grandfathers are nobles of the mantle. This title cannot be inherited but it can be earned by any commoner as a reward for great service to the Empire in the Legion or as a civil servant. Father suddenly grows quiet and looks at you looks, looks you in the eye intently. Yes, and someday you will earn a noble title soon, son. All in due time. Sir Tibber's school teaches children of all stripes, nobles of the mantle, lowborn parents, and no <clears throat> nobles of the mantle and lowborn parents can send their sons here. And every passing day, the children of noblemen invent new ways to snub and bully the commoners. Most of the time, the bully, the bully leading them, is Dedrick, the son of the secretary for the imperial. Chancellery, yes, <clears throat> for the Imperial Chancellery, and a self-important slob. The sons of noblemen never pick on you, however. They know that your father has, an, has been ennobled by the mantle. However, Dedrick and his retinue soon choose Thomas as their favorite victim. Time and time again, you ask your friend not to pay them any mind, but again and again, Thomas grows angry and slaps their self-satisfied. And snaps at their self <clears throat> Damn it. But again and again, Thomas grows angry and snaps at their self-satisfactory mockery. It is early morning. The students are busy. Flocking to the classroom for the next lesson. You wave Thomas over when you see him. He waves back at you. Then a bucket of slop splashes over him. Needless to say, it is the work of Dedrick and his entourage. You hear his familiar creaky laughter. The tailor son sinks. How dare he sit next to decent folk? Thomas clenches his fists. You're dead, Dedrick. He throws himself at Dedrick's haughty entourage like a soldier ready to wage war. He attacks them first. This is just what they expected, and they are free to retaliate. He barely makes one movement before four pairs of hands grab him at once. 
Nedrick sneers and kicks her friend in the belly. Thomas gasps for air and starts coughing. You stand between them and Dedrick, ready. You stand between them as Dedrick readies another kick. The noble son's cocks an eyebrow. Why did you mingle with commoners, he asks. Your father is a noble of the mantle. You ought to be friends with your own kind, your equals, not the dirt beneath your feet. Behind him, four boys hold Thomas down as he struggles fiercely. The other students are watching you, frozen with fear. Dedrick hotly extends a hand to you. He clearly expects you to shake it. What will you do? Uh... Yeah, I'm not going to shake this fucker's hand. Challenge Dedrick to a fight. Single combat. Turn him over to the teachers. Teachers ain't gonna do shite. They demolish the nobleman's son. The children of parents who have been ennobled by the mantle still bear the commoner's lot. Now, let's fight this brick. You do not shake his head. Instead, instead, you challenge Dedrick to display at least some dignity by fighting you one by one. That is, if he considers himself a nobleman's son, of course. Dedrick's face grows serious. There is no way for him to refuse this challenge in public. Dedrick makes a sign and Thomas is released and pushed to the floor. He gets back on his feet cursing and itching to rush at them again, but you hold back your friend. The teacher of Imperial Law comes into the room just in time. Everybody immediately turns, returns to their seats. A day full of lessons begin. You keep daydreaming of Derdrick's face and how you're going to put an end to that nasty smile of his. Let's catch that bastard together. Clean his clock. He hurt me, not you. The deal has been made, you tell your friend. This is a matter of your honor now. Thomas huffs angrily, but agrees. Dedrick is already waiting for you in a narrow back street by the school. His retinue by his side. You walk forward and give him an opportunity to end this dispute once and all, once and for all. This is the nobleman's way. If you win this battle, Dedrick and the other children of the nobles will never pick on the commoner's son again. If he wins, he will never stand in their way or protect other students. You will fight him one on one. Dedrick walks forward uncertainly. You roll up your sleeves, raise your fists in a fighting stance. Dedrick tries to copy your movements. You hit him first. Dedrick does manage to land several glancing bows, but he's fighting a losing battle. He has never been in a real street fight. Thomas nods in approval. You've learned a lot from him. It does not take long for Dedrick to stop fighting back. One more blow, and he squeals and raises his hands. You have won. You turn to the other nobleman's son with a victorious look on your face. No more teasing. And if anyone else says so much as one bad word to Thomas, they'll pay. Dedrick's former retinue disperses silently. Not too bad. And now we're going on to our 13th year. But I think we'll leave the rest of our adolescence for the next episode. And we'll see you guys then.